Hey folks, Joe Biden. I just got off a eight, nine hour flight from Washington to the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv. And I met with the uh, mayor of Kyiv, who was a world famous boxer, uh, but he has another fight in his hands. One is Moscow crossing the border and violating international norms. And the second is endemic corruption that oligarchs have been uh, pursuing and uh, engaged in for decades. And it's a hard, hard fight. We are committed to help them on both scores. That's what I'm here about. And I'm going to be talking uh, with the president, with the prime minister, and then on Tuesday, sitting down to address their RADA and make it clear that American support is real, but it, we expect, we expect them to step up. I said, no, I said, I'm not going to, or we're not going to give you the billion dollars. They said, you have no authority. You're not the president. The president said, I said, call him. <laughs> I said, I'm telling you, you're not getting the billion dollars. I said, you're not getting the billion. I'm going to be leaving here. And I think it was, what, six hours? I looked, I said, I'm leaving in six hours. If the prosecutor's not fired, you're not getting the money. Well, son of a bitch. <laughs> got fired. And they put in place someone who was solid at the time. Good evening, everyone. This is Ari Kopel with Shattering the Matrix. Tonight, we have a whistleblower, one that you'll definitely want to pay close attention to. Mike McCormick is the author of The Case to Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden. He was the former White House stenographer working in the West Wing, traveled on Air Force Two as well as Air Force One, and he brings to light a series of events that challenge the integrity of the Biden administration. His eyewitness accounts from six years of service traveling with Joe Biden to Ukraine and Honduras paint a vivid picture of a man that McCormick describes as buffoonish and unpresidential. The book delves deep into the heart of what McCormick calls the kickback scheme with Burisma Holdings, a scandal that allegedly enriched both Joe and Hunter Biden. Mike McCormick's meticulous cross-referencing of materials from the Hunter Biden laptop, President Obama's White House website, and congressional testimony by Biden's co-conspirators adds a layer of credibility to his claims. And the material that Mike McCormick presents is truly mind-blowing. The book also doesn't shy away from discussing the treasonous Alliance for Prosperity, a scheme that allegedly funneled hundreds of millions of U.S. taxpayer dollars to cartel-affiliated cocaine smugglers in the Honduran government. This revelation, if proven true, would represent a gross misuse of power and a betrayal of public trust. In short, it's treason. Mike, thank you very much for being on the show tonight and having the courage to write this amazing riveting book. Uh, and then on top of that, coming and talking about it, you definitely are not shy about it. I think it's ph phenomenal. So th again, thank you for, for being on the show. Thanks, Ari. Yeah, it's, thanks for having me on. Absolutely. I'm going to take this little thing off because I don't like being on the show. But uh, what I would like to ask you uh, is, what is your goal for tonight? Like, what is it that you would like to accomplish by being on a show like mine or being anywhere talking about this? Because, I mean, maybe you might be a little bit concerned that the administration, the Biden administration or anyone else 
might want to retaliate. So yeah. how do you how do you do this? Well, I get asked that a lot. And so I like your question. Um, first of all, my goal is to tell people we're in a serious time in our world. Um, you know, I, I talked about vice, I, when I worked for Vice President Biden, he was buffoonish and unpresidential. And so I, you know, quickly about me, I started in the White House as a stenographer with the press office from 2002. And I worked there till 2018. There was a little span of time from 2007 to 2010 where I was trying something else in a nonprofit in Richmond that didn't work out well. So I came right back and wound up working specifically for Joe Biden. Um, and uh, what I found, because I worked for three different administrations, Bush administration, Obama administration, any year of the Trump administration, I had an ability to look at Joe Biden not as some, you know, uh, political operative who wanted the best for him. I could compare him to what I'd seen um, Vice President uh, Cheney do. And so that's, that's when I said he was unpresidential and buffoonish, because compared to Cheney, he was. But then what happened was I was given uh, in 2021 a copy of the Hunter Biden laptop, the original uh, laptop that was distributed amongst White House employees. I was given it by in uh, 2020 as President Trump is leaving office. I was given it by Garrett Ziegler, who um, uh, wrote the report on the Biden laptop and has been instrumental in getting a lot of the crimes in the laptop out into the public. So he said, look, Mike, take this laptop for, you know, no, no questions asked, no strings attached, and just see what you can find. So what I found is Joe Biden is evil. It's not just he's buffoonous and presidential, he's evil. And there are plots within this laptop that I, I can go back through my time with Joe Biden and remember where I was in April, 2014, and look in the laptop and see the email traffic, how it corresponds with my memories, there's this, it's just the subterranean reality. They were running a kickback scheme in Burisma, in, in Ukraine, through Burisma. And then there was this, uh, pro, this Alliance for Prosperity, which at the time sounded very noble and, you know, like a, a good deal, a little expensive. Well, it turned out it was just sort of a cover story for getting Joe Biden and the Obama White House tied in with cartels in South America. And that's what's happened to our southern border. So the reality of those sort of buffoonish or unpresidential or even sometimes, you know, publicly pronounced policies that everyone bought hook, line and sinker during the Obama years are coming home to haunt us now. The southern border is a wreck. Ukraine is at war and drawing us into a war with Russia. I mean, the headline today was Russia tells Biden you know, he's going to retaliate for the attack on the civilians, Russian civilians on the beach in Crimea. Yeah. You know, and so this is this is a reality that we have to understand why we are where we are. And it's not just that Joe Biden's walking around kind of like a, you know, a, a puppet or a, a ventriloquist dummy who doesn't know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. And he, he, there's a very strong chance he could repeat his uh election steal i think it was an election steal in 2020 and then what do we have i mean this is a very important time so we got to get the word out of who the real joe biden is and that's that's my goal with this book and i had to do it because i've tried to get the word out through being a witness in front of a grand jury or being a witness in front of the congressional oversight committee investigators and they won't have me in as a witness so that's another thing we can talk about Oh, yeah. No, we're going to talk about a lot of things. Um, you know, the two tier justice system, it doesn't matter, you know, if the person uh, is caught red handed killing somebody, you know, they're going to hide that no matter what. And yet another person does, you know, very minor things and they're indicted you know, indicted, I don't know how many times. So yeah, we have a problem on our hands. And uh, this is very reminiscent of what happened in Cuba. I think it's on steroids. Okay. And uh, so um, I have a question. Now you started off not really being in any type of party, you weren't affiliated with any Democratic Party or Republican Party, you were basically 
kind of neutral when you started the whole thing. And then you kind of, from what I understood from the book, because I did read it cover to cover and uh, it's riveting, but uh, what I think I understood is you were pretty neutral before you started the whole thing. And now you kind of shifted a little bit more to, to the right, more conservative. Am I correct with that? Or I would say I was, a, I identified myself as an independent. Um, I didn't have a specific party when I started there in 2002. I did like President Bush at the time. I did vote for, uh, no, actually I didn't vote for him in 2000. I voted for uh, the other side. It was a really, that's a, something I deeply regret. But even then, you know, Bush, President Bush's turnout, what we really know now about what happened with the Iraq war is a terrible disappointment. So, um, and then, you know, I, I was always sort of conservative in how I looked at government. I just consider myself a Jeffersonian conservative small government is better, sure. you know, and use, use uh, local, local solutions are better than a national solution. So just sort of in those lines, but I didn't understand, I didn't care that deeply about the politics I was witnessing firsthand, you know, day to day, I just sort of let it go in one ear and out the other and get, you know, went home and did my job. That's the job of stenographer was just to sort of, we had to record all the interviews that were done in the Oval Office or on Air Force One or Air Force Two, and then make a transcript of it. So I heard a lot of stuff over and over again. And, you know, in politics, it's all the same words, you know, whether it's Bush words or Obama words or uh, Trump words, it's basically all the same words. And so you just kind of get immune to hearing, mm -hmm. um, you know, anything that stands out, which is why I actually became very positive on Trump because when he started speaking, I started hearing him in 2015, he stood out and he still does for how he approaches politics. And I think that's what America really needs now. So, you know, I stand uh, as a, a Trumper. I went to this, listen to his speech downtown on January 6th at the ellipse. I didn't go to the Capitol. You know, I've tried to um, raise the alarm about Joe Biden for years and it's still hard to get through to people, yeah. but I, hopefully this, this book is getting there. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just wish more people would, you know, take it seriously because there's so much evidence in there. Um, obviously they're not looking at it on purpose. Right. Um, so I have a question with respect to why you feel it's just, you, you know, what your opinion is of why, you know, people like David Wise and, and others are not taking you seriously. Uh, the stuff that's in this book is so compelling. I mean, these are receipts to me. Um, right. How does how does a how does anyone, you know, ignore this? Uh, I, I It's a rhetorical question because I kind of know. But I'm wondering, you know, if you could explain it to the audience a little bit. What, what do you well, think? Well, you know, happening? that's a good question. And the timing is perfect because about, what, three weeks ago, I was up in Wilmington, Delaware at Hunter Biden's trial, where David Weiss and his prosecuting team use the evidence in the laptop. So they verify that the laptop is usable evidence. It's validated. And so, you know, for a while, the Democrats are trying to say, well, it's Russian disinformation or it's this, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's been manipulated. That's not the case now after that trial. And because they were at trial, they were out in public. I had a chance to ask them personally, and they dodged it. They ran away from me. Yeah. And what, what happened with that was um, I went up there a couple days, uh, and, and I also talked to the media, because the media is part of the cover story, too. So the Weiss grand jury and the media are running the same cover story. Don't ask questions about Joe Biden's background. He's okay. We're just looking at Hunter. And that's not what is in my book. My book is about Joe. and so. Um, I remember going up there and talking to David Nakamura of the Washington Post, and I had a copy of my book. I said, David, here's a picture in my book of Joe Biden walking down off the ramp from Air Force Two and shaking the hand of Vitaly Klitschko in Ukraine. This is him committing a crime. And he just didn't want to talk about it. And David and I had traveled together and, and uh, several times on White House trips, and he knew who I was. He, he recognized, and he knew what, about my book. He can't report on that. And That's I also, amazing. I did the same thing with Mike 
uh, Mamoli of um, NBC News. Same picture, same thing. Mike, you know, this is a picture of him, and he's just sort of shrugged it off. They don't need to report on it because it's not good for their their careers because they know their career means covering for Joe and looking the other way. You know, the most powerful tool that the media has is the power to ignore. And so, you know, they don't want to look at it. They don't want to look at it. And so the reason the media was there was because there's this trial and there's an actual court proceeding. And David Weiss was in the courtroom and his prosecutors were in the courtroom. I had sent one, a copy of my book to one of his prosecutors, a guy named Leo Wise, uh, back in February. And I've been on the media saying, I've sent Leo Wise a copy of my book. He should have a copy of the book. It's evidence to have me testify in front of the grand jury. Never heard from him. I never heard from Leo Wise. I got in touch with Leo Wise last year at this time when they were putting together this disastrous Hunter Biden plea deal that got thrown out by the judge. And that's what led to this trial where now he's guilty and facing potentially prison sentence. He's guilty of three felonies. So um, because of that, I was in this courtroom watching this proceeding. At the end of it, there was a press conference and David Weiss walked out. He didn't take any questions. I was standing in the room ready to ask him questions. They didn't, they didn't take questions. He started walking up and I yelled out, I was a witness to Joe Biden's crimes on Air Force, and I made a mistake. I said Air Force One, and I corrected myself. I said Air Force Two, you won't have me in front of your grand jury, you know, and then he just walked out the door. Thank you for your consideration. Thanks. We've heard from jurors on Mr. Weiss, would you entertain a plea deal in the California case? I'm a witness to Joe Biden being a criminal on Air Force One, Air Force Two. I need to be a... All right, sure. Basically, they ran away from the question, but that question went out over the air. Because people were televising it, yeah. So I got I got a couple of um, notes back from people. Uh, um, James Rosen from Newsmax texted me. He said, "Mike, was that you?" I heard. I said, "Yeah." He said, "Let put put together a quick email. We'll see if we can get you on TV on Newsmax tonight." I said, "Okay." So that didn't work out. But as I was sitting in front of the building where they had this press conference, I look over and who walks out with this prosecutor, Leo Wise. And he's walking out without any an accompaniment, no, you know, no assistant with them, no, nobody there protecting him. And I was like, I'm going to go ask him a question. He's in public. So I ran up to him. I said, hey, Leo, and I had my phone running. But I, instead of videoing me and Leo so I could make a really big TV splash with it, I had it pointed down at the ground by mistake. So all you see is like the, the pavement. But I have the audio. And I'm like, Leo, I sent you a copy of my book. I, you know, I'm a witness to Joe Biden committing crimes on Air Force Two in 2014. I want to testify in the grand jury. I can't talk about the grand jury is what he said. Well, if I if somebody knows that Joe Biden has has evidence that Joe Biden's a, a criminal, how do we get in front of the grand jury? I can't talk about the grand jury. And then he was walking into a building and I said, well, can I get in touch with you? Do you have a card? I don't have a card. He walked in the building. Oh, wow. So he, he's literally running away from me. They can't handle the truth. They can't handle the truth that's in the book. And so they're trying to suppress it. They're trying to keep it out of the headlines, all that. I've had really good um, success getting it, you know, getting a lot of news on podcasts like yours. And so that's how the word is getting out. Absolutely. Well, definitely. I, I appreciate you you being here and, and, and being so candid about all this information um, with respect to a crime committed on Air Force Two. Can you share with the audience what you're talking about? Because yes, these are all allegations, but what did you witness? Well, I witnessed it and I turned a um, a witness tip. I went through the FBI uh, witness tip website and filed a witness tip. What I witnessed was because I had a copy of the Hunter Biden laptop, I went in there and I, at that, this is 2021, uh, in the fall, 2021, 2022, in the spring. I'm reading through all these emails, and I took that as, look, this is absolutely evidence that this is here. I don't question it. These are real emails. Yep. There are emails of Hunter Biden and Joe Biden discussing Burisma. There's a meeting where Joe Biden has um, Hunter Biden. I want, you know, Hunter Biden and his, his uh, colleague 
Devin Archer, go into the the West Wing and meet with Joe Biden on April 16, 2014. This is just days before Joe Biden goes over to Ukraine with all this energy assistance. They are secretly plotting to be on the board of Burisma. Hunter then, two days later, secretly joins the board of Burisma. Joe Biden knows this. He's in this meeting with Hunter. He knows this. He's, he's basically telling him how to do it. And then the, he's on the plane into Ukraine. And as my in my role as a stenographer, I'm in the back of the plane. And Jake Sullivan walks the back of the plane. And one of the reporters asks, what's the energy assistance you're bringing for Ukraine? And he names four things. Two of them relate directly to benefiting Burisma. Jake Sullivan may not know at that time that Hunter Biden is on the board, but Joe does. So what Jake Sullivan is doing is being part of a conspiracy that Joe Biden is being committing fraud, waste and abuse. He's using his position to, you know, it's called malfeasance. He's using his position to commit malfeasance in office. Well, he could at the, he could have at that time later, as he found out that Hunter was on the board, come forward and said, hey, wait a minute. This is wrong. I don't want to be a part of this, but he never did. He's still covering up for him. So from that moment forward, he was in the conspiracy and he still is in the conspiracy. So those are the two charges I leveled against Joe Biden to this FBI tip form. Conspiracy and malfeasance in office. And they're still ongoing. That conspiracy is ongoing. It's not like it, you know, it was 2014. So this is almost 10 years ago. It's over 10 years ago now. There's there's no... uh, statute of limitations on it because it's still ongoing. So that's, that's a valid thing that should be looked at in a grand jury. It should be looked at in an investigation. After that, there was some news um, coverage of my trying to get this FBI tip in. And it got to the point of going in front of the oversight committee. Chairman Comer's oversight committee isn't looking to impeach Joe Biden. So they had me in for an interview. And I interviewed with them for about two hours. I told them all about the Burisma stuff. I told them some other stuff. And they said, at the end, they said, look, you're a whistleblower. Um, You can say whatever you want to say at this point in time. But, um, you know, we're going to have you talk. We're going to recommend you talk to our our colleagues in the Senate. They're also doing this investigation. So they went over and talked to the guys in the Senate. And they're the ones that sort of said, hey, look, there's a lot of interest in this time period around Joe Biden's trip to Ukraine in 2015. And that's what kind of spurred me to look more closely at it. And that's when I found that video of Vitaly Klitschko shaking the hand and realized that was a crime. That whole trip was a crime. So they did help me find that out. And I kept them apprised of my, to my sub stack. My sub stack, by the way, is midnight in a laptop of good and evil. And so I write constantly, uh, constant updates, more information I find, more evidence I find in my Substack, And I, they never got back to me. They never called me in to be interviewed. They didn't want me to be under oath. They don't want me under oath. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Um, how deep involved do you believe that Obama is with this? Obama in, the, in Ukraine, Obama is kind of the invisible hand behind it. I personally, I think Joe Biden um, was a lot more of the puppet master than the puppeteer in the Obama-Biden relationship. I think he had a lot of behind the scenes influence over over Obama and that he used that to leverage whatever whatever, uh, assignment Joe wanted, Joe got. He got to go to, he got to do Iraq. He got to do... um, Ukraine. He got to do China, the Asia pivot. Mm -hmm. He got to do the uh, uh, Recovery Act in the early days of the Obama Biden um, White House when I wasn't there. And those were big things that he really wanted. So Obama wasn't really that active as a president. He basically, uh, you know, let Joe Biden run a lot of the show behind the scenes. I mean, Joe Biden ran uh, for the Recovery Act, he had the cabinet come in and he ran cabinet meetings with on the Recovery Act in the cabinet room like he was a president. Wow. It was like he was sort of the junior president. So, um, but as things progressed, Obama kept his hand in it, kept his name in it, would support Joe, but he's he's more supporting the cover-up than he is 
sort of I'm the idea guy behind it. I think Joe Biden was a lot of the ideas behind Burisma and, and doing the corruption there. And he he profited his, you know, he put himself in there. Obama didn't need the money from Burisma. It was chump change to what Obama does. But Obama gets his big money from Hollywood. You know, he's a superstar president. He's an A-list Hollywood guy. He will always get money from Hollywood. So he doesn't have to worry about, you know, nickel and diming Ukrainian oil executives or people like that. Yeah. So, you know, he, he just, it was beneath him. And he's a very sort of egotistical guy. And Joe Biden was just sort of a, you know, really a dirty politician from a small, small state in the East Coast where nobody heard of him until he was vice president for Obama. Do you think that this is Obama's third term? Do you think that Obama is actually running and calling the shots now? I don't think that. I think what you're seeing right now, and it's interesting, you kind of saw it in that um, clip they showed uh, where Obama led him off the stage of that Hollywood fundraiser. You know, Obama was very patronizing there. And Joe Biden had to put up with it. And the question is, why did Joe put up with it? He's pretty old and he's very feeble. So he just, he had to put up with it. But Obama didn't have to do it like that. So why did Obama do it like that? And I think you're seeing also behind the scenes in what's happening right now, this week, Joe Biden is out of the public view for a long extended period of time, prepping for the debate. That's the story we're told. Meanwhile, there was an actually an interesting um, Twitter, I follow uh, this guy on X, um, I can't remember his name, but he, he basically staked out the uh, Obama's rental house there in Calorama neighborhood in D.C. And he said there was a big meeting this weekend after this Russian attack of Susan Rice, um, Samantha Power, uh, Victoria Newland, and a couple others were over there. And I think Obama might have been in there having this meeting in their house and why, and, and in this person's mind, in this Twitter guy's mind, Sergovin, I think his name is Sergoyan, um, Bill Sergovin, something like that. He said, they're plotting, you know, they're, they're plotting to be the puppet masters. This is them being the puppet masters. I don't think that's the case. I think what happens is Biden has his loyalists and they're right now up in, uh, they're up in Camp David. And they're setting up the steal. They know what they have to do to steal this 2024 election. Because up to this point, they thought they could manage Trump's rise with these lawfare cases. And it's not working. And all of a sudden, they're in June. And they've got to figure out how the steal is going. And they've seen the clues all along of how the Republicans are handling the vote, uh, voter turnout, how, whether they're looking closely at um uh, you know, scrutinizing ballot balloting processes. And so they now have the, the information needed to set up this next level steal. That's what they're doing at Camp David. They're not getting Joe Biden ready for this debate. They're setting up the steal. This is his crew that set up the steal in 19 in uh, 2019. He, that's his that's his infrastructure he put in place. So he doesn't he's not getting rid of that. He's not surrendering that to Obama. He's not going to turn that over to Michelle Obama or anybody else in the Democratic Party. That's his infrastructure that he owns. He's going to use it for himself. So Joe Biden will definitely be the presidential candidate. And that's what Obama and these guys are trying to figure out. What do we do about this? How do we work around it? And, you know, we'll see what happens at this convention. One thing I think that I predicted is that I think Joe Biden changes the vice president. Um, that can happen at any time. He doesn't have the vice president isn't really elected. They're appointed by the president Correct. and they're, they serve at the pleasure of the president. So the president can say he can get there and say, you know what? Kamala's not going to join me on the ticket for 2024. After all, I'm going to switch to this person. And behind the scenes in the Democratic Party, the, the idea will be known that that means that Joe is going to retire pretty soon after the election, and this next person will be in charge. So let's vote for Joe and the ticket. We don't care about Joe. We just care about the, the vice president who's on the rise. And so we'll see if that happens. Um, I mean, it depends how, how, what kind of payoff they can give Kamala. What do you think about the rumors that they'll replace Joe Biden with 
Gavin Newsom, Michelle Obama, maybe somebody else prior or during the convention. Do you think that's a possibility? No, I, I think Joe hangs in there. I think you he's do. got I think he's got the steel infrastructure in place. Okay. He's running the show. And so and but there is a fight. I mean, there's a fight between the old line Democrats, the Obama, um, Clinton Democrats versus the Biden cabal. Okay. And it's a fight right now behind the scenes. They don't want to talk about it. But that's what's happening. And so Joe will be the president. He will be reelected if there's a steal that works. And he will have a vice president who will supposedly, you know, assume control. And he'll name that vice president based on what's the best deal he can get for himself. Right. I mean, it's all, it's all about leverage with him. You know, he's always about using his position to leverage himself up higher. And right now, you know, they think they can still pull off a steal. And we'll, we'll see. Pray to God they don't. So how does that look like? I mean, last time we kind of figured out, okay, this is what they did kind of to steal the election. Right. What do you think is going to do? I mean, obviously all eyes are on Dominion type of voting machines and that type of thing. Uh, absentee, you know, ballots. What do you think is going to happen this time? Do you think they're going to use the illegal immigrants coming in to the country to, you know, register for voting and and there are just no IDs? And I mean, what what do you feel might occur this time around? Well, that's exactly why they brought all those people in. I mean, that was a thing that was in process from, you know, back in 2014 is when it started 10 years ago. Yeah. They came in and, you know, they call it replacement theory and they say people are racist for using it. But that's really what it was. And so um, and that's what I wrote about in the book. The Alliance for Prosperity chapter was really reveals how to what lengths Joe Biden and his cohorts were willing and his co-conspirators and his operatives were willing to go to get these uh, to you know relax these immigration laws. Because Trump came in and Trump started doing things that they couldn't begin to counterman. They couldn't do it. He was better at being a politician than they were. He had, you know, look at what he's done in the last month. He's had, a, he's had a, uh, an amazing uh, rally up in the Bronx. The Joe Biden uh, jury that was out of Wilmington came back against him and found his son guilty on, on all, all counts. Those are Joe Biden's people. And, you know, when I was in that, one of the things I'll say real quick about that is when I was in that trial, the jury was a cross section of Wilmington, Delaware, but they were people that all had close associations with the Biden family over the years. And when and the reporting on the, the uh, trial by New York Post said the first night they went out, um, they, uh, to Lenny, they thought about it for an hour and then um there were six and six split. So after an hour of sort of discussing it, they said, all right, let's go back and, and think about it. Well, they went back and, and it went home. The six holdouts went home and they thought about it in their own, in their own homes, in their own neighborhoods. And they came back the next morning and say, you know what? We're not going with, we're not going with, a, a, you know, innocent verdict. We've got to call guilty. Wow. So they, they shut, they, they basically said, we're, we're not supporting Joe Biden. We're not supporting his family because the arguments in the, in the trial by the defense at the end, the closing arguments were to the jury. You have Hunter Biden's life in your hands. Look at the first lady in the front row of the, of the courtroom. She stands for you. Everybody stands for you when the jury comes in to the room because you're so important. They're really pushing that emotional. You're a superstar. Go, you know, support Joe Biden. He's been there for you. And it didn't work. So Joe Biden lost that case, too. So so uh, Trump's out there doing these rallies in the Bronx. He just did a rally in North Philadelphia. Both were hugely successful from what I've seen. And Joe Biden's not doing successful stuff. So that's where I think, you know, you have to look at for hopefulness about this deal. Did they get away with this deal? We'll see. They're signing up people right and left. There's some great grassroots activities, act, activists out there. I don't know what they're going to do with questionable ballots. And there is a lot of depth to this steal. I mean, you know, 
we'll see what the we'll see first of all how how this debate goes. Yeah. Then we'll see what the legal what the judge comes back for his sentence of Trump. Then we'll find out, you know, what this means for people. They can still turn the narrative because they have the press on their side. They can still turn that narrative and say, oh, all of a sudden, you know, it looks like uh, such and such is happening and the polls are shifting and, you know, it doesn't look good for Trump. And all of a sudden everyone's like believing, oh, yeah, there's going to be a change in the, in the in the country. The sentiment has changed. And that's the plausible deniability. That's all the plausible deniability that Joe Biden needs. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, then then they have this election and it's not a real election. 2020 wasn't a real election. We just have to make sure 2024 is. What does that look like if (laughs) he steals the election? I mean, can you I mean, uh, the American people going to stand for it this time around? Because last time, okay, well, we kind of knew. Right. That there was a steal. We didn't do anything other than the January 6th situation where people had the right to protest. Right. Uh, right. But they made everybody an example. Right. You, you, this is what happens if you protest. It's, we're going to call it an insurrection and we're going to put you in jail without a trial jury or anything. You're going to rot in jail. We're going to torture you and you're going to probably be so miserable. You're going you're going to commit suicide, which some of them have done. Um, people are scared. So what do you think might happen? This is just your opinion. Would happen this time around if there is such a steal again? I mean, I don't, that's one thing I don't want to speculate on. Um, it would be terrible for this country if that happened. And it would mean a lot of good people face terrible outcomes after doing so many good things for our country. I don't know how that happens. You know, one of the things I talk about in the book is that I feel like God is giving me ideas and helping me understand this evil that I see step by step. And it's almost indescribably how big it is now that I see. And we just have to keep fighting it. I don't know what happens if this election gets stolen. It would be probably the darkest day in American history to that point. And I don't know what happens after that. And I don't really, I don't want to put my head on it. I just want to get, stay as positive and upbeat and say, I think God is on our side. This is working. There's really big things happening. Trump is, is out there, but these are, this is the war of good and evil. And, Evil is in the White House and evil is in other places of power. And that's what's so worrying about this election. There is so much evil and there's so much money behind it. And there's so many people so intent on delivering an evil outcome for our country. And there's a lot of people who are perfectly happy with having an evil outcome. Even if they're not evil people, they just think that's how it should be because they are you know, dedicated Democrats, and they think this is this is how it should be because they've been brainwashed into believing into believing that our system has to get get rid of not only President Trump but all of his supporters. Totally, totally. Let's talk a little bit about Honduras. Yes, yeah. there's a lot of corruption that went down there, and if you could bring the audience up to speed about that especially talk about that little trip that happened that you kind of made a side little stop in a different airport. Right. Very far, about an hour and a half away from anything, you know, it was kind of remote, which was kind of very strange. So if you can go into that, because I think there's a lot of corruption that went down during that little time frame. So right. Four years. So uh, what you're talking about, that trip was 2012. There was the one I, I took a trip as a stenographer with Joe Biden uh, and there was no press on the plane, which is unusual. Most of the time, almost all the time, I had to be on the plane with him only if there was press there. If there wasn't press there, they didn't want me around. And um, But that trip, they wanted me around because there were some press events he was going to be doing in Miami at the very end of, of the trip. So the trip went to Mexico and Honduras in 2012, and then it wound up in Miami and he did some interviews there with um uh, Hispanic t- television. Um, so 
we're in, uh, we're leaving Mexico and we're on our way into Honduras and the military aide comes walking to the back of the plane. He's a Navy commander dressed white. So I can picture him to this day, big, strong guy. He goes, Hey, I made a terrible mistake. Um, I miss miscalculated the length of the runway. It's rain there and we can't land there. We have to redirect to a different airport. That's a really big red flag because the mill aides have all kinds of support out there. And if there's weather support, there's a security umbrella of other flights and everything support. And there was no press on the plane. So they could come back and basically tell us a story. And we didn't, I didn't care. I was like, okay, sure. He said, it's going to be an hour and a half motorcade ride into this, into the place we're supposed to go. We were supposed President Trump, I mean, sorry, Vice President Biden was going to go meet with a group of uh, Central American leaders at some big Central American conference. Well, the guy who was running Honduras at the time was a drug smuggling criminal. His son was smuggling drugs in the United States by the time. He's now in prison. The ex uh, president is a guy named um, Pepe Sosa Loba. He's sort of under house arrest in Honduras, and he had another son murdered, executed by, you know, we're, no one's sure who killed him. He knows. I don't know. Um, that was a couple of years ago. So it's a very brutal, cr- lawless place, even if you're the ex-president. And so he was in, engaged in this. Well, we do this diversion. We land at the small airport out in the jungle. It was an American base, and they did a lot of uh, CIA and um, USAID missions out of there. And it was basically, they had a lot of like uh, fixed wing aircraft for doing surveillance for drug interdiction, stuff like that. And so there's all these Quonset huts. It's just this funny little, funny little base out in the middle of nowhere. Well, when we landed, the vice president of Honduras was there waiting for us. So if it was a last minute diversion, it's an hour and a half drive from downtown. How did she get there? And I remember there's, and there's no pictures of her being there that I've seen on the internet, which is unusual because they were made a big deal at that base. And anytime there's a VIP, take the picture. Well, they had a picture of Joe Biden there that day, but they didn't have a picture of her and Joe Biden together. So she shows up. If you're flying an Air Force Two, you learn this fact about Air Force Two and government planes. You can put something on them. It flies into Washington. It lands in uh, uh, Andrews Air Force Base. It can get walked off that flight and walk right into your car and be driven home. No one will ever look at it. So if you're the vice president and you have a special box handed to you in Honduras and the box has something in it that you really want, I'm not going to say what it is, but it could be a number of things, that box gets walked off the plane, put into a van, and taken to your vice presidential residence. Easy peasy. It's no problem. And I think that's what happened because Joe Biden was down there to talk to them about um, this drug interdiction program the U.S. was about to start, and it didn't go well. It went really badly. And it went so badly they had to cover it up for several years. It was called the Operation Anvil. And so um, basically a bunch of Honduran civilians got killed by drug runners that were allied with the government that were using U.S. government property, helicopters, things like that. So this is a terrible thing. And and it seemed like what this Operation Handle really was about was using U.S. assets in Honduras to uh, hand over to the Honduran government so they could, you know, steal cocaine from rival gangs and give it to the the son of the president. So after this uproar, uh, the news got back to Washington. It wasn't good. So they had to run a cover up. So they got rid of that president and got a new guy. in. The new guy in is a guy named Juan Orlando Hernandez. Juan Orlando Hernandez is going to be sentenced at the end of this week for smuggling cocaine into the United States by the ton. He was affiliated with the Sinaloa cartel and the U.S. knew it. And they put him in there anyway. And Joe Biden knew that. And Barack Obama knew that. And they put him in there anyway. And within uh, a month of uh, him taking office in January of 2014, 
there was an undercover investigation done by the DEA of these Honduran guys. And the brother of the president, a guy named Tony Hernandez, is recorded in electronic surveillance saying, yeah, we'll have the government smoke, smoking cocaine up here right away. So this is and this is in accordance with the Sinaloa cartel. So this is a cartel job that they're setting up. Well, that summer in 2014, um, all of a sudden, all these kids start showing up on the southern border, unaccompanied minors. It becomes a crisis. So Joe Biden puts together what he calls the Alliance for Prosperity. And he has these government officials from Honduras, El Salvador and Guatemala, the uh, the Northern Triangle countries, they call them. They come up to the U. They come up to the Washington. They meet with Obama. They meet with Joe Biden, and then they get hundreds of millions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer money over the next three years, from 2014 to 2016. Joe Biden gave 500 million dollars to Juan Orlando Hernandez, who has been convicted of cartel-level drug smuggling, and he gave that to him knowing that he was a drug smuggler. Which real now I said. You know, this level of evil is almost incomprehensible. What I find out recently, just over the last couple of weeks, I put it in my substack, is the Catholic Church was involved in this Alliance for Prosperity, too. They had meetings in the White House with uh, Dennis McDonough, who was then the White House chief of staff. So all these presidents come from these Northern Triangle countries in July of 2014. In August of 2014, these uh, there's meetings between a guy named Cardinal Theodore McCarrick and White House Chief of Staff Dennis McDonough. Three th- in a, three weeks in a row, he meets from, with him for an hour. This is when they're devising the policy. McCarrick was in charge of Catholic relief services. He worked closely with Pope Francis. Pope Francis was a friend of his. So, um, uh, so Pope Francis. All of a sudden, what what comes out is this guy, McCarrick, what McCarrick was doing was was networking the Catholic Church into a cartel affiliated drug smuggling human trafficking program. The evil on that is incomprehensible. But the fact that the pope was okay with it because Pope Francis was pro migration. He wanted migration. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're talking about with this replacement theory. This is the beginning of replacement theory. And the Catholic Church was in on it. And now what happened on Thursday, just a few days ago, the Pope is moving to excommunicate Archbishop Carlo Maria Vigano Vigano, um, because he's been a critic of the Pope and the Pope's policies. But Vigano is right. He's, you know, and I've been trying to be a witness in this for this guy, Vigano. And, so, and I've called the, you know, uh, the um, diocese here in Washington and said, hey, I'm a witness that can exonerate uh, uh, Archbishop Bigano. I know things that he, there's information that exonerates him and I can tell you about it. And they don't want to talk to me. This is another level. We don't want to talk to him. You know, I sent him an email yesterday. So it's 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 not a long time. You know, it's, they have some time to get back to me. But this is where podcasts like yours are so helpful because I can get the word out and say, these guys need to talk to me because this guy was right. There was bad stuff being done in the white house by Cardinal McCarrick at the, apparently at the Pope's instruction. And the guy who can tell us about it is now the secretary of the veterans affairs, Dennis McDonough. He's a cabinet, he's a cabinet secretary. He should be called in front of somebody to explain why were you meeting with this cardinal? Then the cardinal wasn't a good guy. He's he's been defrocked in 2018. He was kicked out of the priesthood because he was a pedophile, and he'd wow. been hiding that for decades. And apparently, Pope Francis was okay with it. So anyway, yeah. Um, yeah. So Cardinal McCarrick was a pedophile for for decades, and it was known by uh, Pope Francis that he was a bad guy. He used to joke about him. Yeah, you're one of the bad guys. You're going to hell. And so this is the evil that's been in place. It's been in place to change the way our government is run. It's been in place to take our voting process away from us. It's in place by Joe Biden and Barack Obama and their operatives. And there are people all around the world who are benefiting from it financially. And 
we have to sit back and say, who's going to win this election? Who's on our side? How does this work? Yeah. Yeah. It looks more and more like a new world governor or excuse me, new world government uh, that is being put into place, shaped into place by all these players that are all on the same page about all of it. You know, it's like, it's almost like the good guys are just too, that we play too nice. We play by the rules. We have certain courtesies, right? They don't. And they're going very, very fast. And it's just, you know, there's, I don't know if there's enough time to actually do anything to correct this is just my opinion. Um, But I wanted to ask you about the children, the, the so many of them that happened uh, in the summer, in the Southern border in that summer of, I believe it was 2014. Yeah. Do you think that there's some kind of a scheme a side business that maybe the Bidens have, who knows who has, with human trafficking, child trafficking? I don't know. Um, I know the numbers are extraordinarily high. So that summer, there were 50,000 young accompanied minors showed up. I don't think all of them got to the right place at the right time. Um, That was 10 years ago. I don't know where they'd be over 10 years. Then um, now, over the last... Four, four years with Joe Biden's presidency, they've been coming in by the millions. And, you know, it's just awful. You listen to um, uh, Bobby Kennedy Jr. talk about going down to the border and seeing the rape trees and the, just the human catastrophe, the evil that's been done down there. And this is all done with the church's knowledge now that we know, with Joe Biden's knowledge. These people have no soul. And so... You know, what's happening to these children? You know, there's estimates of over 100,000 unaccompanied children showing up at the border. They've been trafficked in by the cartels to go where? They're sending them around. And it's the Catholic agencies that are part of it. And it's just beyond comprehension to me that um, there is an awful outcome awaiting when the real truth comes out about all this. And so... You know, my all I can tell you is what Joe Biden, what I saw Joe Biden do and say, and what I find in White House records about what he did and said, and his operatives. And so, I don't know what's happened to those kids. I hope, I hope they haven't been sold, sold, yes. trafficked. I mean, they if have. They're been. alive. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know where they would go. I don't know yeah. how that would happen. I, I just, and I don't want to put my head on it. You know, there's so much evil. I, you know, when uh, my friend uh, Garrett Ziegler was doing this, he had to go into the Hunter Biden laptop and see it all the oh. ugly, gory, selfie for it. And I used to pray for him and say, buddy, I'm praying for you. you. You know, I don't do it. I never looked at it. I only looked at the emails. It's when you get your head up to the extent of the evil that's out there, it's just almost overwhelming. It so is. we just got to keep yep. poking away at it taking away at it and get it get it out of there i agree um do you feel that what you're doing now makes any difference i mean again because my hope is by having somebody like you on a show like mine and you going elsewhere as well and talking about all these important issues that people maybe that are on you know on the fence about Hey, should I vote Trump? Should I vote Biden? What should I do? They changed their mind because there's, again, all they have to do is pick up your book and see the evidence there. Um, But is it too little too late right now? I mean, are we at the point where does it make a difference? Do we just surrender? I mean, I know that you just talked about we have to believe, right? We have to have faith. Uh, But is that enough anymore? Um, so um, I'll leave that up to you, and and then we can discuss how people can find your book and all that. Okay. Yeah, I think I think we will prevail. I have to believe that the best part of America is still ahead of it. I believe that for my children. I believe that for my family. I believe, you know, I won't stop fighting to make sure that happens. I know there's a lot of people out there fighting 
in their own way, you're fighting with your podcast. So, and I think, I think the awareness is coming out and, you know, it helps that there's people out there like, um, Elon Musk who made Twitter a lot, a lot more of a free speech platform. It helps that there are billionaires who out there were sort of always behind the scenes are stepping out and saying, you know what, we need better management of our government, of our economy. I'm backing Trump in ways that they didn't have, they didn't do that in 2016 that I remember. So, um, how are we doing? We're still there? There. We are. We're getting, we're getting yeah, down. We, there. we are. So, uh, that's what I think we got to do. We got to get there. We'll I get agree. there. I think we will. We'll get there. Yeah, we, we do have to uh, pray a lot and have a lot of faith. I I think that people really need to get off their couches, is my opinion. Uh, and and to do a little bit more, maybe be a little bit more active in the whole process. I, I really, truly believe that. Uh, I don't know that just prayer right now does it or cuts it. Um, I think that, you know, God gave us in the intelligence and the uh, the will, right? The inspiration to take action. And action may mean a whole bunch of things, you know, like what we're doing now. Um, right. So right. I think it's, I think it's going to take a little bit more than just willful, you know, wishful thinking. But right. um, anyway, how do people find your book? I mean, I bought it from Amazon. Uh, phenomenal. I have it all highlighted. Um, and uh, how do people find you and then your Substack if you can share all that information? The Substack is Midnight in a Laptop of Good and Evil. And my, um, uh, on, on Truth Social and X, I'm at Joe Unauthorized, at Joe Unauthorized. And um, my book is on Amazon or it's on Barnes & Noble, The Case to Impeach and Imprison Joe Biden. And, you know, it's, uh, I really appreciate you reading it and then talking to me about it. And we can do another, we can do more of this. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do another one. We definitely must because you know what? Every day is something else. And right now we're being threatened by, you know, the potential of Russian aggression uh, on our actual territory, on our land. And that's a big problem. And, you know, Joe is still president and we don't know if he's going to continue. So... I think there's going to be a lot more conversation happening. I really appreciate you being on the show. For those of us uh, that are listening uh, that wish to join ShatteringTheMatrix.com, this is the type of information that we share on that platform, and it's totally free to join, so please join me as well. And Mike, until next time, thank you so much. God bless. Thanks, Ari. Take care. <laughs>